recent Gallup poll estimates that one out of every two Americans believe in the existence of UFOs. Over 15 million people have reported seeing UFOs, of which over 2,000 were encounters with landed UFOs and their occupants. UFOs have been fired upon by jet fighters and anti-aircraft missiles, but with no effect. They give off powerful electromagnetic charges, often causing the breakdown of engines and electrical circuitry. They evoke strange and fearful reactions in animals and frequently cause profound psychological disturbances in humans. They have the ability to materialize as if from nowhere, but more often vanish into thin air in the midst of a sighting. Both human eyes and radar instruments have observed unbelievable aerial maneuvers, such as 90 degree turns of several thousand miles per hour, and have been clocked at speeds up to 16,000 miles per hour. There can be no longer any doubt, even to the most ardent skeptic, that UFOs exist. The question is, where do they come from? If they come from another galaxy, then they would come from at least two million light years away. Even traveling at light speed, 186,000 miles per second, it would take two million years to get there. But suppose that UFOs come from some distant star in our own galaxy. If these space visitors were to travel one million miles a day, it would take 70,000 years to reach the Earth from the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, which is 25 and a half trillion miles from Earth. Other stars are thousands of times further out in space. Conservative estimates indicate that a spaceship carrying 10 people and traveling five light years to and from a nearby star system at 70% of the speed of light would consume 500,000 times the amount of energy used in the United States in one year. But there are other complications of space travel. Space is not a vacuum, but contains cosmic gas, dust, and particles. Nobel Prize winner Professor Edward Purcell of Harvard points out that a space vehicle traveling at the speed of light would collide with this space material in the form of radiation and with the impact of several hundred atom smashers. Man is now in the transitional period before the dawn of a new age. In his book, Flying Saucer Pilgrimage, Bryant Reeves summarizes his findings in this statement. From our analysis, the teachings of the space beings appear to support many of the principles taught in Oriental philosophy by seers of the Far East. UFO researcher John Weldon then offers this question. How credible is it to think that literally thousands of genuine extraterrestrials would fly millions of light years simply to teach New Age philosophy, deny Christianity, and support the occult? And why would the entities actually possess and inhabit people just like demons do if they were really advanced extraterrestrials? Dr. Pierre Guerin, an eminent scientist associated with the French National Council for Scientific Research, concludes that UFO behavior is more akin to magic than to physics as we know it, and that modern UFO knots and the demons of past days are probably identical. One of the greatest waves of UFO sightings in modern history came in 1965, with more than 500 cases reported during the summer months alone. One such case was near Ann Arbor, Michigan, where 50 people and 12 police officers in three counties reported having seen objects flashing across the pre-dawn skies. That evening, 87 female students at Hillsdale College near Ann Arbor watched an object flying around and flashing bright lights for a period of about four hours. Life magazine said, call them what you will, flying saucers, unidentified flying objects or optical illusions. They are back again and seen by more people than ever before. Last week, the manifestations seemed almost to have reached the proportions of an invasion. In Washington, House Minority Leader Gerald Ford called for a full-blown investigation. In 1917, 
what may have been the largest crowd ever to witness a UFO occurred in Fatima, Portugal. 50,000 people watched in amazement as a huge silver disc began spinning like a windmill and dancing about in the sky. After plunging toward the earth, it climbed back into the sky and disappeared into the sun. One night during the summer of 1948, Clyde W. Tombaugh, the astronomer who discovered the planet Pluto, was sitting in the back of his home at Las Cruces, New Mexico. He and several witnesses, including other members of his family, watched a strange glowing craft move overhead. All of the witnesses agreed that the object was definitely a solid ship and that it was probably some form of extraterrestrial device. November 5th, 1945, a squadron of five Avenger torpedo bombers with 14 experienced crew members flew out of Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station in Florida. It was a short routine flight. Each plane had a full load of fuel and weather conditions were excellent. But something strange happened. The flight leader called in and reported not having any sense of direction. Air control then ordered the squadron to head due west. The leader, with alarm in his voice, then said, we don't know which way is west. Everything is wrong, strange. We can't be sure of any direction. Even the ocean doesn't look as it should. He then stated that weird, unidentified aircraft were closing in on them. His radio went dead. All five planes disappeared without leaving a trace. A giant Martin Mariner with a crew of 13 was dispatched to search for the five missing planes. It had the capability to land on the roughest of seas, but this plane also disappeared into the grim silence of the Atlantic. What followed was the greatest search operation in history. For five days, an armada of 300 planes and 21 ships crisscrossed the sea and sky, but no trace of the six aircraft or 27 crew members were to be found. To this day, it remains a mystery as to what happened. In 1960, it became apparent uh, to the military that if they were going to have any significant covert operations, they were going to have to be underground. The reason was people are extremely observant. They notice everything that's going on. And if there was going to be huge transportation of materials, men, equipment, all kinds of stuff, that it was going to be uh, have to be underground. There was a major meeting with all the major uh, uh, contractors, the big contractors like uh, Morrison Knudsen and, and those type of people. Uh, and the meeting included the, uh, the highly specialized uh, area of underground uh, uh, operations as far as drilling down there, how you move that kind of dirt. And they started then, basically in 1960, building all these underground facilities. Uh, right now, uh, they're just all over the United States. It's just incredible how many there are. Uh, there's a network of tunnels that uh, connects Edwards Air Force Base uh, with the Tehachapi Base, with Tonopah Test Range, Groom Lake, George Air Force Base, California City, uh, China Lake. Uh, it's a tremendous uh, network. Uh, I have varied and many uh, uh, people who have told me uh, that they exist, that they have been down there. Uh, I have a friend that uh, is a hydraulic engineer on one of the tunnel boring machines. It's 28 feet in, in diameter. He works at the Nevada test site where the uh, tunnels go down almost 3,000 feet. After I had, uh, of course, uh, got out of the service, I worked uh, uh, for the government, you know, as a test uh, pilot on various different uh, particular aircraft. While I did that particular activity, the, I was asked if I would <clears throat> mind uh, working on some simulators, and I thought that was a good idea, good for my future, so I did uh, develop this particular process of joining this material. It took quite some time, over a period of about four years, and then it was indicated to us that we'd go on a, a special project uh, in New Mexico, which we did, and it was about three or four years after I, we had gotten there that we found out that uh, these were simulators for 
that we would be engineers on simulators for flying discs.